Well, I told you that today's a special day for many reasons. And one of those reasons that I think is the most special is we have the honor of having with us a couple who have sown into our lives. I'm so thankful that the, the Lord spoke to Pastor and Margie Lamb to come to Kania, Ohio, and that they obeyed that call of the Lord. Pastor Lamb is my spiritual dad. When I was growing up, I didn't really have a, my, my father didn't live with us. He had um, left my mom, and so my mom raised me, and I didn't really have a dad there at, at home with me. And Pastor Lamb became my spiritual dad. And uh, I've always tried to model so much of my life after this man. And I'll tell you, I've, I had the honor and the privilege of, of, of working alongside him uh, in ministry for 22 years we worked together. And uh, I can tell you, this is a man of God like you won't find anywhere else. And so we are so happy to have them here with us today. And as Pastor Lamb comes, I want you to let Pastor Lamb and Margie know how much you love them and appreciate them this morning. My biggest fears is that some morning I'm going to fall off this stool. <laughs> it's good to see you all. special day, more involvement in the community, and I tried to plan my message around the theme, and I wanted to maybe sing a song that, there it is, it's been a long time since I've puttered with this keyboard. How many are planning to go today to the community function? You're going to work over there? All right. So, <clears throat> leave when you have to. I won't be upset. But I hope to dismiss you in time. Let me touch him. Let me touch Jesus. Is that your desire? Let me touch him as he passes, passes by.
such a desire. Oh, there's a lighthouse on the hillside that overlooks life sea. When I'm tossed, it sends out a light so that I every word of that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Almost every time I pray, I intentionally go back in my mind and I intentionally thank God for the night and the place. I preached a message some time ago, perhaps not here. I said, everybody needs to have a place. Everybody needs to have a place. You need a place, a time, where that you can think back to where you had an encounter with God. Your Bethel, your place that God touched you and you touched him. You may have come away limping. Amen. But you've come away having been touched by God. And you've come away knowing him better. And you've come away having settled some issues with him. Amen. How many know we need to settle our issues? We need to settle our issues with God. We need to get along with God. And talk things out with him. Until nothing is unsettled. 
until the issues are settled. Hallelujah. And until we know that we know that we know him. Hallelujah. And we know his purpose. We have an intimacy with him that holds us when the storm passes by. Hallelujah. We have mentioned already, your pastor mentioned already, and I appreciated his prayer. And the mention that, and I've been praying that prayer where Jesus stood in the midst of the storm and said, peace, be still. And they said, what manner of man is this? What manner of man is this? That even the winds and the seas obey him. Hallelujah. Someone asked me about our family. Our family is in Florida. And my wife and I have been talking, what were we thinking? Why didn't we send for them? Why didn't we get them out? And of course, they all have lives and they have things to do. Vicki, uh, who is our late son's wife, she has remarried since Randy passed away. She and her husband, Dave, uh, are living in a double wide and they've moved over to our cottage, which is made out of uh, cinder block. But they're right in the eye of the storm. You go up a little further, our granddaughter, Kayla, and her husband live in Spring Hill, Florida. And uh, he is a paramedic. And he's one of those first responders. And he's not even home now. He's somewhere where they, they're prepared. He's a first responder. And so Kayla and Cody, our grandson, and our granddaughter are both there in Center Hill. And they're also right in the eye of the storm. And so we've been very concerned, of course. How many of you have family in Florida? And look at that, all over this building. Hallelujah. And we need to say, as our pastor said this morning, we need to, we need to stand and say, peace be still. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Peace be still. Thank you, Pastor Carson and Jessica, for inviting us here. I want to say again, thank you all for being so kind to us. Beautiful offering that you gave us the last time we were here. How, how that you love us. We appreciate you so much. You have been our family. You're our children, our grandchildren. Margie and I moved away from our home and came north. And there was nobody here but us except we had some cousins living in the Willoughby area. She, Margie's cousins. But in order to see family, in order for our children to see grandparents or cousins and aunts and uncles, we had to drive 600 miles. And that was before the interstates. How would you like to do that every holiday? I'm going to speak out of Matthew chapter 16. I am aware of time constraints. I have a very long sermon. As Gene Rice said one time at camp meeting, he said, if God anoints me, I'm going to preach. And he said, if God doesn't anoint me, I have a lot of dry facts to give you. And I'm praying that God will have me say what he's laid upon my heart in an adequate way this morning. Just one partial of a verse of scripture, Matthew 16, 18 B, Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Hallelujah. Upon this rock, I I will build my church. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, would you stretch forth your hand today and do that which only you can do. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will touch us this morning to the degree that we will be transformed, that we will never, ever, ever be the same. None of us want to be the same, Lord. We've not come here this morning, Lord, because we had nowhere else to go. We have with great intention and anticipation...
come to this house of prayer this morning. And we fully intended to change. We fully intend not to be the same. We fully intend, O oh Lord, to, to apply your word and your challenge to us this morning. We don't want to be the same. We don't want to be the same. We want to be different because of being in the house of prayer this morning. And Lord, as my pastor says, would you give that anointing this morning that makes, makes preaching easy. Hallelujah. Holy Father, Holy Spirit, welcome to this house. Welcome to this house. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord has been touching my heart all week with some thoughts. My greatest fear and concern always is this, that I will not be able to deliver the heart of God and what I sense that God wants delivered. I never leave the pulpit feeling like I've done a good job. I've never left the pulpit and felt like I needed to pat myself on the back. But I leave, I arrive this morning humbly. And I will leave that way, God willing, and pray that God will bless you today. The question, what does it really mean to be the church? What is Jesus Christ trying to do? What is the Lord trying to do through his church? What was his intention for the church that he has built and that he has preserved and perpetuated unto this very, very day? I think in order for us to understand his intentions, we need to understand what the church is and, and God's plan for each one of us. I think today we're in danger of losing sight of the importance of the church. We are in, I think we are in danger of losing sight of the importance of the church. The church has been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. The precious blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son. I want us, first of all, this morning, before we, as we try to understand what I think the church ought to be, let's first of all consider what the church is not. First of all, the church is not just a good idea. The church wasn't an afterthought of God. And God wasn't sitting up there one day and saying, you know what, I got a good idea. The law hasn't worked real good. And people didn't listen to the judges real well. And they haven't listened to the prophets. As a matter of fact, they've killed them and stoned them and done away with them. And nobody wants to hear about them. So you know what? I've got this idea. And he looks over to Jesus and says, what do you think about this? How about you go down to earth in the form of a, of a, of a child and, and, and get crucified? And we'll, we'll start a church. We'll try again. We'll, we'll try to do it over. No, the church is not a good idea. It's not an afterthought of God. Secondly, the church is not a building. We call this the church. And we use that interchangeably. And I think it is an important distinction, by the way. I think this is the most important place you can go. I think this is the most important building in the community. Oh, the hospital is important because when we get sick, we go there. And I thank God for the hospital. But you find something here that you can't find in the hospital. You find something here that you can't find anywhere else. This is the place to go. This is the place to be. The church is an important place. I think we have come to the place in our culture that we don't value the church and the gathering place of the saints like we should. And we have a tendency of coming to church when we don't have anywhere else to go. We have a tendency of coming to worship when we have nothing else to do. I don't believe that the church is an afterthought of God and I don't believe the church ought to be an afterthought of ourselves. Amen? I think the church ought to have a prominent place in each one of our lives. I grew up in a, in a church-going family. We walked to church most of our lives. We walked to church, and I tried to figure out this week how far it was. And I think it was probably a mile or a mile and a half one way that we walked to church. And we walked there in the daylight, and we walked home in the dark. 
But it was never a question in our house. I never heard my father ask my mother one time, are we going to church today? I never heard my mother ask my father, are we going to church today? It was an assumption in our house. If it's Sunday, you go to church. If it's night, you go to bed. If you're hungry, you go to the table and eat. Amen? And if it's Sunday, you go to church. If it's Wednesday night, you go to church. And in our house, it was Saturday night too. We had it Wednesday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. And it, well, there was never a question. You always went to church. If we got company, and it came about church time, my father would look at our company. And he'd say, well, it's about church time. And you folks are welcome to go to church with us if you'd like. But if you won't, don't want to go, you're welcome to sit around here and we'll be back after a while. But it's about church time. Church was an important place in our life. And I believe that church needs to be an important place in our life today in the 21st century. If you believe that, say amen. See, the church is not a, a, just a social gathering, even though it is a social place. It's not a place of protest. Some churches get so involved in protesting that they forget about that this is a life-giving hospital where people come to find eternal life through Jesus Christ. It is a place that they come to be delivered from all of the addictions in their lives. May I say to you this morning that everything that you need, God can provide through this house of prayer this morning amen it's not a place to file a grievance if there's something you don't agree with there's no grievance process we don't have any papers here to fill out if you don't like something if you want a job we have papers you can fill out <laughs> If you, want to, if you want to get busy in the ministry of the, of the church, in the ministry of the Lord, of the gospel, we have papers that you can fill out that says, I want to be involved. But we don't have any grievance procedures. You can't fill anything out. If you're not happy, you just need to go to God and settle your issues. Amen? Amen. See, I didn't plan on saying that. <laughs> have you ever been unhappy in the church? Don't lift your hand. I used to tease. I said, I make everybody in my church is happy. I used to tell other preachers, I said, I have a very happy church. This is the happiest church in the state. I make people happy. Some are get happy when I come and the rest get happy when I leave. <laughs> Some of them get happy when I get up to preach. Others get happy when I sit down from preaching. But they're all happy. <laughs> Nothing, hey, nobody said you're going to be why am I talking like this? Nobody said you're going to be happy all the time. When you drive up, there's nothing on the sign that says, at the happy church, you're going to be happy all the time. Well, I guess you can be if you're happy the way I think happiness ought to be. The New Testament has about 80 different images to describe the nature, the function, and the ministry of the church. It is an inexhaustible uh, subject. May I say to you that the church is a militant army of Jesus Christ that we have some things to do. We are the army of God. We're not people. This is not a place where we hunker down. Now, if the hurricane was coming, it might be a pretty good place to hunker down because it's a pretty solid biz, uh, building. But this is not a place that we come to hunker down. This is a place that we come to get reinforced. When Satan has beaten us down, when we have many, uh, we come in here bleeding and broken and, and bruised up from the battle of our lives every day, we come here to get, to get reinforced, amen? We come here to get rejuvenated. We come here to get reinfused. This is an, an infusion center. Amen. It's an infusion center. It's where you get infused with the Holy Ghost to prepare you to go out to make a difference. How many know that the church, this is not, the church's job is not just to come out here and, and, and just sing hallelujah. And, and it's a great thing to do. We come here to worship. But our worship is to prepare us to make a difference in the world. We are to attack the kingdom of darkness. Amen. Amen. Attack the kingdom of darkness. You see, when there's a battle inside the church, the church scatters. 
But when the battle is outside the church, the church grows and the church becomes more effective. So that's just a couple of things that I think the church is not. Let me share with you a couple of things that I think the church is. Number one, it's a divine organism composed of born-again people, living stones, spiritual temple. It's a place where spiritual sacrifices are offered up. It's a place of learning and studying. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Become a partner with me. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. This is a place of learning and studying. It's a place of worship. It is a place where that we exercise and acknowledge our dependence upon the Lord. It is a place for praying people. We are a praying people. The church is a place for prayer. It's a place for prayer. We have some women here in the church that pray. They've been praying for years. Amen. Years. I don't know, 20, 30 years. They meet once every week and they pray. I have to tell you the room has not been overfilled most of those years. But this, is a, this, this must be a praying place. We must be praying people. We can never, ever, ever achieve what God wants us to achieve unless we have some time of prayer and go to him and, and ask for his divine in feeling, praying. I, I remind him often. I remind him often. Oh, God, you said, if I ask, I will receive. When you read that in the Amplified, it says, ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. For he said, if you ask and keep on asking, it shall be given to you. If you seek and keep on seeking, you're going to find it. If you knock and keep on knocking, it's eventually it's going to be opened into you. God never promised us that a 30-second prayer was going to get the job done. We need to be people of prayer who get on our knees, as I said, and seek God until we settle the issues of our lives. Until God empowers us and anoints us and sends us forth in power and under the anointing. Hallelujah. Praying, God, oh God, help me, Lord. God, help me to be a member who doesn't just come to the church. But God, I pray that every day of my life, you will give me a divine appointment. Because I understand that I'm not here just to soak it in, but I'm here, Lord, to give it out. Amen. Oh God, I'm here to touch I am here to touch. I'm like the good Samaritan. I need to find those people that are bruised and bleeding who have been robbed of the goodness of their lives and I need to restore them and put healing balm on them. And I can't do that until I've been with him. Amen. Hallelujah. We're, we're praying people. We're sharing people. The church is a sharing and serving organization. Or organism. Let's look at some characteristics that defined the early church. Number one, it was a commissioned church. These are pretty simple to you. I won't spend a lot of time on them. Jesus, the amazing thing is, I'm preaching on God's work and our hands. The amazing thing is that Jesus comes down here and gets these 12 almost renegades. You know, Twelve guys just like us, fellas. Did you know the disciples were just like you, Dave? Ed, they were just like you. Greg, they were just like you. Those guys had problems. <laughs> oh, I know what I just said. You guys have problems. And as long as you are in a human being and in the flesh, you're going to have problems. I've been a Christian over 50 years. I've been preaching almost 50 years. Yeah. 
I hate to admit this to you, lovely folks. But you can ask Margie, I have problems. <laughs> we have a little joke. We look at each other and, 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 I, and we say, you know what, honey? I tease her and I say, the whole world's crazy. Everybody's crazy. I never knew that until the United Mine Workers Coal Union uh, hired, a, hired a doctor to come in. He was a company doctor. And he was a Jewish guy. And he told my father, he said, Howard, he said, there's something wrong with everybody. And he didn't mean physical. In other words, everybody has an issue. Agreed? Why do we act like we don't have issues? Why don't we just admit it? Jesus hired this bunch of renegades. These were not nice people. They were insecure. They fussed over who was going to get to sit with him. They fussed who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Arrogant. One of them had his, their mommy come. <laughs> Talk to Jesus because we want to sit one on the right hand and on the other side. You think they didn't have issues? Jesus trains them for three or three and a half years. And he says to them, hey, I'm going to build a church. Hallelujah, I'm going to build a church. But by the way, I'm going back to heaven. Thank you, sir. You've come down here and started all this stuff. They're looking for us. We're up here hiding out. We're scared to death. They crucified you. What do you think they're going to do to us? None of us can walk on water. None of us can say, peace be still. None of us can say, get up and take up your bed and walk. You want us to build the church? You started this, now you're leaving. Oh, I said, I forgot to tell you, it's my work, but it's your hands. Hello? It's my work. It's my work. But it's your hands. Good work. I remember the first hand. Big old gawky hand of Jack Alexander when we bought this property. And we came out here and dedicated it. And so we had Jack to preach and came out and dedicated this and as I recall, Jack got on his knees and poured out some oil on the ground and put that old big farmer hand on the ground. And in Jack's own way, cried and dedicated this land to God. Did I realize what I was biting off? I don't think so. But we got our shovels. Those of us that had shovels. Most of us didn't have a shovel hardly. But we put our hand to the plow. And put our shoulder to the wheel. And I would just like to acknowledge if I could remember all of them this morning. In a Roth. An old widow woman on Social Security baking apple pies. Sister Holly, Pastor Carson's grandmother and Rick's grandmother. Ethel, his mother. Ken and Judy Pierce. Margie Lamb. How many others? Anybody else? I miss anybody. Lift up your hand. The Kipparts. These people worked like men. These women came up here and dug the heat ducts in the old building or in the ground. Ditches this deep. Pipes this big around. And they dug it by hand. Women. 
with shai shapa kando bo robo sore. With wheelbarrows and shovels. They heard this preacher had come to town and started a church. I don't know if they realized what they were signing up for. Hallelujah. He forgot to tell us. He forgot to tell them. It's my work, but it's your hands. It was a commissioned church. Go you therefore, he said. It's my church, but I want you to go. I want you to go. I want you to go. Go you therefore and teach all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things that I command you to do. And lo, I'm with you. What? Always? Excuse me? A few days later, they see him going up in the clouds. You said you'd be with us. He said, oh, I'm going to pray the Father and he'll send somebody else. He's going to send another comforter. I can only be with you physically, but he's going to be with every one of you. He's going to infuse every one of you. You're going to be filled with the power and you shall be witnesses unto me all over the world. And the Bible said they went around the world and they turned the world upside down. Because church was their business. Amen. Church. It was not a sideline to them. It was not an afterthought. It was not just a good idea to them. It was important. It was life and death. It was an obedient church. They being assembled together with them and being assembled together with them commanded them they should not depart from Jerusalem but wait for the promise of the Father which he said you have heard of me and they did that and they did that and they were baptized third it was a witnessing church Mark 16 20 and they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following i remember when you know uh, d james kennedy of the coral ridge presbyterian church came up with this thing evangelism i think explosion and we the church of god had one called evangelism breakthrough remember remember barney blows had that cadillac he loaded six i think it was six of us up took us to west virginia dean fowler was one of them barney blows myself I think Ethel Robson was one of them. I can't remember who else. I remember Barney said to Dean, he said, Dean, here's a second set of keys to the car. You keep them. In case we get locked out of the car, you can let us in. So Dean put them in his shirt, coat pocket. We get out of the car, go to a restaurant or something, come back. Barney goes, Man, I left my keys in the car. Give me your set, Dean. Oh, what a bunch. What a bunch. Dean said, mine are in the car in my coat pocket. Barney said, what? But it was a witnessing church. Ethel, Ethel Robson was not an upfront person, but she was a prayer warrior. She was infused with the anointing of God. And she had a heart for the lost. And she was on our teams, and we sent people out every Tuesday. Every Tuesday. They, we got papers from all the members and said, give us, give us papers of your, of your relatives and your friends. And, you know, talk to them and see if they would let us come over. We, we, we witness, we witness, we witness. They went everywhere. They went everywhere. They went everywhere preaching the gospel. And the Lord worked with them, confirming the word with signs following. And God blessed the church. Amen. The church was not an afterthought. 
afterthought. The church was our, was our heartbeat. It was our heartthrob. It was important because we realized, I remember the night on July the 3rd, 1966, that God saved my life. And I feel like that man that God healed from a terminal illness. God, I owe you. I owe you. I owe him. How many of you this morning do you realize you owe him? Do you realize what a privilege it is to sit here? Do you realize what a privilege it is to have a worship center like this? To have worship like this? To... Apparently you have heat. And air conditioning. Amen. Isn't it wonderful? Wonderful. It was a unified, spirit-filled church. I've got to close. As I said, it was a praying church. It was also a persecuted church. A persecuted church. Let me back up to the praying church. Peter and John have been arrested for healing a lame man. First thing the church does. You know what I do? Call my attorney. <laughs> you know? Isn't that what we do? We call home. We get one phone call, right? Who do we call? Good commercial. <laughs> Who do you call? Call my wife. Maybe she's glad you're in jail. Don't call her. But the Bible said the church went to prayer. And when they prayed, the place was shaken. Herod killed James and arrested Peter. And the church went to prayer. Paul and Silas beaten half to death in the prison. And they sang songs and went to prayer. Amen. They weren't a whining church. They weren't a grievance filing church. They were people. Who, who had the will and the plan of God as a central theme of their heart. So, finally, six, it was a persecuted church. Paul, you know the stories, persecuted the church. Finally, in seven, it was a hopeful, victorious church. After Jesus left, they expected him to return quickly, but he never came. He never came. How many of you thought that Jesus would have come by now? Let me see your hand. Look at that. Probably 30% or maybe even half the church. We have been preaching this for years. I've heard it all of my life. We've been preaching it for 2,000 years. But the problem was the church started to die and people began to lose hope. And Paul had to write them a letter. And he said, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And they that are dead, even though they're dead, they, the dead in Christ, shall rise first. There's hope. There is hope. It was a hopeful, victorious church. They learned that death was not the end. Amen. This Wednesday, I will bury Wanda Land. That's her maiden name. We were raised up with her. I've known her probably for 60 years. She used to sit on my knee. I thought I was big and she was little. And I've learned now that I was only four years older than her. And I guess that's quite a lot. If she's 10 and you're 14. And she sat on my knee. We used to just... My wife and the family lived in the same house. They're like sisters and brothers to us. This is the fifth funeral that I've been involved in since I came to Ohio in the past three months, five funerals. This is two that I've conducted and three more that I was involved in. That was happening in the early church. And this, there was a sense of hopelessness. Everybody's dying. Everybody's dying. 
But in Revelation 7, 9, after this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. They showed up to worship. Hallelujah. Showed up to worship. Hallelujah. I have to close. One of the essential attributes of God is his self-sufficiency. There's an article and I want to read quickly. The Bible says that God has life in himself. John 5, 26. All of the life in the universe is a gift from God. He has no needs. Listen to this. There is no way he can improve. To God, nothing else is necessary. Hearing this? He does not need our help in anything. Think about that. But because of his grace and his love, he allows us to be part of his advancing plan on earth and being a blessing to others. We are the ones who change, but never God. He is self-sufficient. Self-sufficient. The heart of my lesson is this. Do we realize how privileged we are? Every day I get an email, every day, every single day, including Sunday, I will have an email on my computer when I get home. And that email is from an organization that ministers to the third world countries in communist worlds and in Muslim countries. And every day they will write me a letter and they will tell me a story of another martyr or another person who's been in prison, put in prison for preaching the gospel. Stories that are almost unbearable and stories that cause people to rise up and defy every one of the authorities. I read a story, I think in one of the martyr books, go ahead and Give some music. Of this man who was, tr they were trying to force him to deny Christ. And these people had tin snips. And they took his little daughter. And they were cutting off her fingers at the joints. Dear God, what an awful, sinful, ugly, evil, wicked, and I'm running out of words, world that we live in. What an awful, awful world we live in. No wonder God allowed His Son to die. No wonder God turned His face away and said, I don't even want to look on the sin, the ugliness that's on my Son today. No wonder He allowed Him to pay the price for us. Things like that, and they cut kept clipping off her fingers and she's screaming and they're saying to him deny the Lord deny the Lord and he said no I read recently of a family whose little daughter was kidnapped by a gang a gang member Muslims and held for ransom they told this man you have to close your church and stop preaching the gospel. If you'll do that, we'll send your daughter home. And he and his wife talked about it and they prayed about it. I'm concerned this morning that my grandchildren are in the eye of the storm. I'm concerned I might not have a house to live in when I go back to Florida. There are other people that won't have for sure. There will be some people who will die, no doubt. And I'm praying, oh God, protect my family, but not just my family, but other people's families. They're in the eye of the storm. And I'm asking God to keep them safe. They're important to us. And here's this man, and he and his wife are praying. And he says, honey, what do you think? Shall we close the church? Shall we quit preaching? Think about it. Think about it. Have you ever been there? No. We are a privileged people. This is what God is stirring my heart with this week. Do you understand? Do you realize what how important the church is to you? Do you realize how important the privilege of being here on a Sunday morning of worshiping God? 
the sacrifice that's been made down through the centuries and the sacrifice. I was here the night. I was here, Greg. You talked about the other Sunday of hanging the drywall. I remember the scaffolding up there. You and who? Rick Robson? Who was that? Marty. We're on the top. And Dean Fowler. And I never knew it. And Dean was dying with cancer. I, we never knew it. And Dean and I climbed that scaffolding with sheets of drywall in one hand. No safety belts. And we climbed that scaffolding all the way up there and handed them the drywall. And they hung it. You, you, do you, you know the sacrifice? Many of you were here. Do you know the sacrifice that has been made in places like this, in houses of worship like this, and how, how grateful I feel and, and how proud I am to come here this morning and to see this wonderful congregation and, and you guys still love me in spite of all of my idiosyncrasies. And I want to say to you, be faithful to your church. Be faithful to the vision. Be faithful to the call. Take time to be the church. Take time to be the church. And this man and his wife concluded. They said, no, we will not stop preaching. I will not stop preaching. And they never returned his daughter. Years later, she showed up back home and they sold her into prostitution. It was not a good life not a good life I'm not saying I could do that I don't know what I would do but I praise God this morning that he called me to preach he allowed me to preach what a privilege what a privilege I feel so privileged this morning that for almost 50 years God's blessed me and I've preached a lot better than I've preached this morning sometimes Sometimes I preach worse, but I still preach. I still preach. Pastor Carson asked me this morning how I was feeling. I said, well, I told him about Gene Rice, you know, he already knew. I said, if God anoints me, I'm going to preach. If not, I'm going to offer some dry facts. But I said, I'm here. I have showed up. Thank God. I want him to look down at me and swat him and say, there he is. I used to walk sometimes from the parsonage over to here and I could feel God watching me. I feel his eyes watching me. There he goes. There he goes. There he goes. He's showing up again. Hallelujah. You may not be gifted, but you can be faithful. Amen. You may not have a lot to offer, but you can show up. Hallelujah. You can show up. Look at that. Showed up again. Showed up again. Showed up again. Did the best you could. Showed up again. Now I'm feeling like preaching this time to quit. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, touch your people this morning. Bless your people this morning. Bless your people. Hallelujah. Touch your people this morning. Are you ready? Are you ready to go? Are you ready to minister? Are you ready for your infusion? Hallelujah. And he doesn't touch us just to make us shout and dance and rejoice. But he touches us so that we can be light and salt and go out of here and change our world. Hallelujah. 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 How many of you raise your hand and say, Pastor, I sure love to have a divine appointment this week. I wish God had sent me to somebody that I could help. Hallelujah. You really mean that? Would you just come and gather right here? Would you just come up and gather for a season of prayer? Hallelujah. 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 Thank you.
you, Father. Thank you, Father, for the freedoms and the privilege of coming here to the house of prayer, to worship, to worship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you sing and worship? Just worship. I give myself away. Yes. I give myself away. Yes. Yeah. 